Hello and welcome to Theotetus Lecture 5. We are going to be talking about the initial criticisms of Theotetus' theory that knowledge is perception in this lecture, as well as going over in a little bit more depth what the question is that has been asked. In particular, we are going to focus on the ways in which the idea of perception at issue in Theotetus's account of knowledge is expanded in scope in the section of text that we're going to be looking at. So the meaning of this word starts out fairly narrow, and it gets an expansion in scope as the discussion continues that makes it apply to more and more things. There's a certain tension in this, which Socrates is going to exploit. So to start off, a little discussion, recap, of the task that has been posed for Theotetus. In some of the earlier discussion, I have slipped, perhaps too easily, into talking about the task in terms of a definition. This is fairly common, and it's fairly understandable, and I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong with it if we look at the pattern of questions that Socrates typically asks, at least in the so-called early Socratic dialogues. We see that he's really looking for something that we might pick out in our own language with the term definition. We're looking for the real meaning of a word. What I mean by that is that we're looking for something in the universe, something outside of just words, that we pick out when we use this word correctly. Okay? There's a Greek term that has more or less the same meaning as our word definition. Orismos starts out life as a word that is related to another term that picks out boundary stones that are placed between areas of land. So you mark the boundary, then it comes to mean something like boundary. And that, not surprisingly, gets applied later to attempts to define meanings of words, right? Where in some way or another, demarcating some territory with the meaning of a word when we give a definition. That Greek term, horismos, doesn't really show up in this discussion, however. Instead, what we get is a more open question, which is also very common from Platonic dialogues, which is a question, what is knowledge? Theotetus is asked what knowledge is, what knowledge really is. Sometimes this question is posed with different words that intensify its meaning. So what is knowledge actually or really? It often gets translated. Socrates says, I want to know what knowledge is. T-S-D. Episteme. What is it? This usually is understood because of the kinds of questions Socrates asks in terms of a search for what we might call the essence of something, in this case, the essence of knowledge. There's an assumption when we talk about essences that among the features of a group of things to which one term is correctly applied, there's some common core or kernel or substance that causes all of these things to be classed as instances of that term. There's a kind of inner core that allows us to correctly call all of these things by this name, and that inner core is what grounds the fact that we're using this term correctly when we use it to specify all the things in this group to describe all the things in this group. 
I say it's an inner core or kernel because it's not always immediately apparent what that thing is. There are going to be, in any particular case of something that is classed as knowledge, all kinds of extra features that are accidental to, irrelevant to, the fact that we call this a case of knowledge. So, for example, if carpentry is considered to be an instance of knowledge, there's all kinds of things about carpentry, that it deals with wood, for example, that it can help you build a chair, that are really not part of the fact that it is knowledge, per se, but features of it being carpentry that are not shared with other instances of knowledge. Not all instances of knowledge deal with wood, but carpentry does, right? We can infer from that, if Socrates is right, that dealing with wood isn't going to be part of the essence of knowledge. Right? The essence of knowledge is going to have to refer to some thing that all the instances that we correctly call knowledge share. And so dealing with wood can't be part of that. That's what talk of some kind of inner essence kernel, common core, gets at, really. This idea that it isn't always immediately apparent what the what it is or essence is that allows us to correctly use a given term to refer to multiple individuals. Sometimes it's not clear what it is because there's all kinds of features that are present when we think of something like carpentry, right? When I say the word carpentry, one of the first things that comes into my mind is wood. And so if I were asked, after being told that carpentry is an example of knowledge, and I really didn't know what knowledge was, I might make the mistake of thinking that being about wood is some feature that makes things cases of knowledge, when in fact, it doesn't seem to be, or isn't. I can say strongly it isn't, because there are types of knowledge that don't deal with wood. So Socrates is asking, what is knowledge? I don't like to uniformly speak about this in terms of a definition, even though a lot of times it's not misleading, because definition can sometimes lead us to think that we're looking for the meaning of a word. Okay, And there's a sense in which we are, but there's also a way to understand meaning of word that can be misleading. When we are asking what knowledge is, we're not trying to figure out what it is that we think we mean by knowledge. So to find a what is knowledge, to find the what is, or the essence of knowledge, a good practice isn't going to be just to look at the ways in which people use this word and then try to construct an account that gets the current use of the word exactly right that captures all and only the ways in which we currently use this word. That would be a great strategy if what we were looking for was the current descriptive meaning of the term, meaning if we're just trying to describe what people actually say, what they're inclined to count as cases of knowledge and what they aren't, that would be how we would go about doing that. We would just look at what people say. We're looking for something different, though, when we're asking what is knowledge. We aren't looking for a definition of a word as it currently is used. Instead, we're looking for a feature of reality. We're looking for something in the world that underlies, and this is the important part, correct uses of the term. It's important to say correct uses of the term because that's one of the primary ways in which what we're looking for here differs from looking for a definition that is a descriptive definition of the way a term is actually used. Because when we say correct, now we are importing into our discussion the very real possibility that some of the uses of a word are not correct. We might currently use the word knowledge to refer to things that don't share this feature 
that is being said to be the thing that grounds or makes correct or justifies all of our correct uses of the term knowledge. Okay, so our current use of the word knowledge might be mistaken in certain ways. And so some of the uses of our word knowledge, if they are mistaken, are going to be mistaken because they don't include the common feature we're looking for when we ask what is knowledge. These won't turn out to be actual cases of knowledge once we have figured out what knowledge is. This touches on something that has been raised in earlier lectures, which is the so-called Socratic paradox, or Socratic fallacy, which is that it's often said that Socrates won't let us look at examples of a given phenomenon until we have a definition, that we can't know anything about what knowledge is until we know the definition. I have suggested that that's not right. That's not what Socrates thinks. The better way to put it is that we aren't certain that any examples we have are definitely instances of knowledge until we have a definition. And from what I've just said, that hopefully is clearer now. We can understand the motivation for denying that examples we currently use when we talk about knowledge, denying that those are all correct. Because we don't know for sure that they're correct, Socrates thinks, unless we have some specification of what knowledge is. Because it's only when we have that that we can go and look at our examples and say, aha, well, all of these share that common thing. Let's say knowledge is perception. All of these things are instances of perception. But this other thing isn't. And so if that's what knowledge is, this other thing isn't going to count as knowledge. So one of the upshots of this idea that some of our current examples might be incorrect, which really only is possible as something we might say when we realize that we're not looking for a definition of a word as it's currently used, but for an essence or a what it is. One of the upshots of that recognition is that we can use examples in trying to figure out what knowledge is. And in fact, we have to, because how are we going to define knowledge if no examples can help us? We have nowhere to start. So we can use examples. The point is that we cannot take them as 100% authoritative until we've done the extra work of finding the what it is. I think in practice, there are certain examples of knowledge that Socrates takes as authoritative. There are certain things that we call knowledge that Socrates is going to take initially, at least, and his interlocutors are going to take as definite cases of knowledge, even to the point where if we find a TSD, a what it is, what is knowledge, if we find an answer to that question that doesn't capture those examples, that could be reason to reject that answer to the what is knowledge question. Right? So there are going to be some examples that are treated as almost certain cases of knowledge and so certain that we can use them as touchstones to test any definitions we come up with. Like if our definition doesn't allow that to be a case of knowledge, then really we have to get rid of the definition as opposed to getting rid of the example. There are going to be other cases that are perhaps more peripheral, that we're less certain about, that if they end up not being counted as cases of knowledge, once we've identified what knowledge is, we're probably going to say, okay, well, so much the worse for those putative examples. Those examples, given what we now know about what knowledge is, aren't going to turn out to be knowledge. So, the upshot here for practical purposes is that we are going to be able to use examples that are coming from ordinary discourse about knowledge. There are things that when we talk about knowledge, people bring up as examples and everyone has in mind. We can use those, but for any one of those, the ultimate status that they have as knowledge or not 
at least in theory, depends upon whether or not they conform to this deeper question, which is what is knowledge as a thing in the world? And when we understand that knowledge is that, does it still make sense to say that this example is a case of knowledge? If it turns out that knowledge is perception, there might be cases of what we now think of as knowledge that don't involve perception in any way. Okay, let's say that we assumed that people could know that 2 plus 2 equals 4. And let's say we really strongly felt that knowledge is perception. And we denied that when I know that 2 plus 2 equals 4, I know that through some perception, through some activation of a capacity for perception. If we really strongly felt that knowledge is perception, we would have to revise our use of the word knowledge in the case of the 2 plus 2 equals 4 example. Now, this example I've chosen intentionally because this is a case where really I think this is a case where we're going to say, no, we have to get rid of this theory. It's not true that knowledge is perception, or it has to be true that somehow when we know plus 2 equals 4, 2 plus 2 equals 4, we know that through perception, okay? But we have to do something to preserve the integrity of our initial claim that 2 plus 2 equals 4 is a case of knowledge, because we're just so convinced, right? So even though I say in theory any examples might be overturned, there are some that in practice we're not going to overturn, because we just feel so strongly about them. So that's a recap of what our task is. What are we doing? We're looking for something in the world that all instances of knowledge share that makes them knowledge. We are given two different models which are supposed to indicate how one might answer this what is it question. Two models for the task that Theotetus has been posed. The first is the account of powers that Theotetus gives us. Remember that example involved Theotetus being presented with a list of numbers that represented areas of squares. Theotetus was presented with this list. It was demonstrated that all of them have some common feature. And Theotetus and Socrates the Younger were said to look for some common thing that they have in common, <laughs> some common feature that they share that allows us to group them, okay? We kind of already know that they group in a certain way, but we're trying to find some way of articulating what it is that makes it appropriate to put them in the same group. That's the first model. Okay, there's a common feature in certain numbers that we look at that enables us to say these belong together and there's a common feature of some other group of numbers that enables us to say these belong together, we're trying to figure out and put into words what that is. That's a way to understand what we are asking when we ask what is it of knowledge. We're looking for a common feature. The second example is a definition of clay, an account of what clay is, that tells us it is earth mixed with liquid. This is put forward as a sensible and informative answer to the question, what is clay? And we're told what it is by means of what it is made out of. It's earth mixed with liquid. So this account of what clay is, is kind of like the powers one, insofar as in both cases, we get some reference to a commonality that enables some group of things to belong together. So we don't just have a kind of random assortment of items that maybe we use the same word for, but that ultimately it doesn't make sense to treat as part of a group. That's what we're looking for. Now, we can call both of these answers to the powers question and to the clay question, we can refer to them as definitions, and I did in the 
previous lecture to some extent. But if you notice, as definitions or as answers to the what is it question, they are importantly, they're importantly different. Okay? It's different to tell someone that some group of powers has this common feature when you're talking about some numerical thing. That might be a structural, formal kind of account versus telling us an account of what something is by listing its constituents. If I were to ask you what a computer is, you might tell me a computer is a device that enables people to get and store information. That would be an okay definition of a computer. That's very different from a computer is silicon chips. Totally different answers. And that's true whether we're asking for a definition or we're asking, what is it? Okay, so we got these two models. First thing I want to note is that they seem to be somewhat different. So just to look again, the account of powers started from an observation. This is our first model. Only some squares have roots that we can say are multiples of one. There are some squares, like four. We have a square with the area of four. I can construct a square with an area of four by using sides that are two long, two inches, two millimeters, whatever unit we're dealing with. And two is a multiple of one. It's one times two. There are other squares, however, that have areas like five, where I in fact can't pick some side that is a multiple of one, some side length, use that as the length of my square side, and then construct a square with an area of that quantity. So five, I can't do that. The numbers that are going to give me as side lengths, a square that has an area of five are going to be irrational numbers. One, you know, two point something, something, something. So this was a pattern that was found. Now, I mentioned that the Greeks don't recognize irrational numbers. They don't recognize one point and then we put all these dec decimals. Okay? And they do recognize fractions but they don't recognize these kinds of irrational numbers. So it isn't so easy to put into language what it is that all and only those squares that don't have roots that are multiples of one have in common. Okay, it's difficult because you can't say, well, this group of squares has irrational roots. That's the thing you can't say. So Theotetus found a pattern that would enable him to specify something. He found a pattern in those squares whose roots are not multiples of one. The squares with these areas can only be produced by multiplying two different numbers together. Notably, we didn't have a reference to irrational numbers here. And that's because we can't, really. If you don't have the concept or you don't recognize it as legitimate, you're not going to bring it up. So Theotetus and Socrates the Younger, they managed to find some specification of what a group of cases has in common that enables us to see why that's a group. There are some groups of things that we might put together that are totally random. Okay, I might, I might put um, the retainer for my braces, my cell phone, the number five, and a novel by Herman Hesse into a group. That's a random grouping. There's no principle that tells me that those things belong together. There's no common feature, I'm thinking. If there is, it's something that is so broad that the grouping is not terribly meaningful, right? So we could just say these are all things that exist, and 
that would be a grouping that would make sense. But then that's not a very useful grouping for most purposes. This group of numbers, we have found a commonality that we can put into words, and that's what we've done. So that's our account of powers. That's the answer to the question, what is it to be one of these numbers in this group? The account of clay as earth mixed with water looks more like a definition at first. It tells us what something is by listing its components. We're getting constituents of clay. Clay is earth mixed with water. Now, this is a common type of definition. Sometimes when you ask someone, what is this? Or if we don't want to speak of definitions, a common answer to the question, what is this? But it's important to notice that this isn't the only type of information that we take to be relevant when we use to define things. And in fact, in the case of some types of concepts, we don't actually take this type of information to be terribly useful. A term like table isn't very well defined if I say it's, it's wood. And that's because it's possible to make tables out of lots of different things. The tables in the Louval Commons, when they have them, are made of some kind of metal. And so saying that a table is made of wood is not going to allow us to see how those are tables. Okay, so this idea of what something is made out of can sometimes be helpful, can sometimes be information that we want to give when we are providing a definition. But it's far from the only type of information that's useful. I list here four things that are often given in terms of Aristotle's four causes, because one of the things Aristotle's so-called four causes are supposed to give us are four possible answers to questions like, what is it for something? So I ask, what is a car? I might say it's steel. I might say it's a vehicle that allows individuals to transport themselves from here to there safely. I might say it's made in a factory. That would be the proximate cause and so on. So these, this is just a list of these things. I can specify what something is by referring to its purpose. Right? That would be if I said, a table is something that you put things on. That might be a purpose-based definition. Now, when we talk about Aristotle, a lot of these overlap. A lot of times, what the purpose of something is actually gets mentioned in its form. So a definition like a table, I assume the form for Aristotle and also Plato, if you look at Platonic Dialogues where we get what look to be specifications of forms of artifacts, it looks like Plato too thinks that purpose is going to be really important when we're saying what something is in many cases. In other cases, form might refer to like some proportion. A table is twice as long as it is tall. I don't know that that's true, but imagine it were. That could be a formal specification and so on. Proximate cause refers to what it is that makes this thing. In the case of something like a human being, Human beings have a what is it that makes us all human. The proximate cause is going to be the same as the form because we are generated by other humans. So the thing that causes us to come into existence, the so-called proximate cause, that is also human being. And so whatever the form of humanity is, that's going to be the same as the proximate cause. Anyway, this vocabulary is helpful if you've done some Aristotle. It is really, though, just a way to show that there's different sorts of information that we might take to be relevant to definitions. So if we just think about the definition of clay we've got, where it's earth mixed with water, we might have been satisfied with that. But if you think about it, how helpful is it to know that clay is earth mixed with water? If you don't know anything about clay, and you knew that clay was earth mixed with water, could you make clay? I don't think you could. Because if clay is just earth mixed to water, we know nothing about what proportions would be appropriate. I might put a little pebble of clay into a swimming pool of water. Sorry, a little pebble of earth into a swimming pool of water and mix it up. That's not clay. It's just water with a little bit of dirt in it. Why? Well, part of the reason why is that the thing I've created is not going to function as clay. 
If I don't know what clay is for, it's harder to know what proportions to mix our ingredients in. It's harder to know when we're done mixing and so on. So to know how to mix clay, it seems like you also need to know at least what clay is used for. If you've never seen clay and someone tells you it's earth mixed with water, that doesn't give you a lot to go on. So getting back to Theotetus' first definition of knowledge. So Socrates asks, what is knowledge? Theotetus says, it seems to me that a man who knows something perceives what he knows, and the way it appears at present, at any rate, is that knowledge is simply perception. The Greek term for perception is eisthesis. We're going to be looking at that in a little bit more depth in the next few slides. So I've given the Greek term here. This word eisthesis, related obviously to words like aesthetics in English. So given what we've just seen about types of accounts, what kind of account, what kind of answer to the what is it question is this? It kind of looks at first a bit like an account in terms of constituents. So similar to the clay is earth mixed with water example. But if it is, it's in a limit case where there's only one thing that constitutes the thing in question. But really, I think thinking of this as an example in terms of what something is made out of, constituents, that's not quite right. Because if we just know what something's made out of, in the case of clay, we saw that usually isn't enough to know when we have the thing in front of us, right? If I just know clay is earth mixed with water, I don't have enough information to know that some earth and water that are mixed together in front of me is actually clay. So when we talk about material constituents, there's usually an assumption, we often say in philosophy, constitution is not identity. So what something is made out of doesn't necessarily tell us what needs to be true for it to be an instance of the thing that it is. So a statue, or clay rather, is made out of earth and water. A statue might also be made out of earth and water, but a statue is not identical to clay. Clay needs to be organized in a certain way to count as a statue. So they're both made of the same things in a certain deep sense, but their identity conditions are different. The whole time I have clay and then a statue and then clay again, if I destroy the statue, I've got earth and water there the whole time. But something comes into being, first clay and then a statue, and then something goes out of being, a statue, and the constituents remain the same. So this definition, where we're saying that knowledge is perception, isn't really usefully assimilated to a case of material, material constituents because of a fact about how Theotetus means this definition. Theotetus is trying to give an identity statement. Knowledge is perception. And what's importantly different about this when we compare it to the case of saying that clay is earth mixed with water, is that in this instance, knowing that knowledge is perception is actually supposed to tell you everything you need to know to identify instances of knowledge. This is more similar to a definition of the sort, water is H2O. Okay, if you know that water is H2O, you just know when you have water in front of you, as long as you have some way to test the chemical constituents of the thing in front of you, you can use this water is H2O information as a fail-proof way to figure out whether you've got water. The same would hold if knowledge were just perception. Whenever you have perception, then you have knowledge. When you don't have perception, then you don't have knowledge. If that's how this definition works, and that's a right definition, then you've got the information you need when you know knowledge is perception. And I'm saying that's, although misleadingly similar to saying what the constituents of knowledge might be in the limit case where there's only one, it's importantly different because when we talk about what something's made out of as an account of what it is, usually that information isn't enough to enable us to understand when we have that thing. Now, this kind of definition in terms of identity where we find something and say, well, knowledge is that, and the two things are identical. We see this in different dialogues like the Lakeys. The Lakeys is a dialogue where the question is, what is courage? And there, one answer that is taken very seriously is that courage is wisdom. Courage is a certain kind of knowledge. 
in particular, the knowledge of what you should be afraid of and when. That is one of these kinds of definitions. If it really turns out that courage and wisdom are identical, that is one of these types of definitions. Now, I spoke too soon when I say it's definitely one of these types of definitions, because it might turn out that courage is wisdom, but that's not an identity statement because there are more things included in wisdom than merely the knowledge that constitutes courage, right? So if courage is knowledge of what you're supposed to be afraid of, that might be a part of the knowledge you have when you have wisdom, but there's more to wisdom than that. Wisdom also includes knowing about God, for example, or whatever. So that is a definition that's at least in the same ballpark, even if not the same, as this one. This is meant to be an identity, it seems. So it's not quite the same, but they're similar. Now, one issue with this kind of definition, knowledge is perception, is that we need to know what perception or aesthesis is in order to properly assess and understand this definition. Okay, that gives rise to something that is going to be at issue in this lecture. And that is that if we say something like knowledge is aesthesis, sometimes that can appear superficially plausible to a larger group of people than it might, simply because everyone has slightly different ideas in mind when they hear the word aesthesis, right? So if a word like aesthesis can have different meanings, that can give a superficial and mistaken appearance of plausibility to a definition. Because when we think about the definitions in some context, we will rely on some of the meanings, and then in other contexts we might rely on others. So it's going to be important in this discussion to think about what isis includes and what it doesn't. Just to have it on the table, I mentioned in the last couple of lectures Bernier's two theses that are used as a way to make more precise what it seems is meant when we say that knowledge is simply perception. Bernier is taking this as an identity statement. What that means in particular is that he's not assuming that knowledge is some larger class than perception or that perception is some larger class than knowledge. He's saying that they're identical, okay? And to get an identity statement like that, one way to express it in a somewhat clearer way is to look at propositions one and two. Proposition one, all instances of perception are also instances of knowledge. Proposition two, all instances of knowledge are also instances of perception. I noted that most of our initial discussion of the definition given has explicitly addressed proposition one, the claim that all instances of perception are also instances of knowledge. We've had discussion about how perception is always veridical. It always represents things in a way that for the perceiver in the situation is accurate. That looks to be an attempt to secure Proposition 1, because knowledge is supposed to be of something that is, and it's supposed to be veridical. It's supposed to be of things that are true or that exist. So we have this question that I've raised about what perception includes and what it doesn't. This is a question that we're putting in terms of the scope of aesthesis, because the Greek word is actually aesthesis. So what is the scope of aesthesis? Well, it can mean perception. This is a correct translation. It's a good translation in our text, because most of what we're talking about would be considered acts of sense perception. But it can also refer to something wider. And this fact is exploited in some ways in this dialogue. This fact about the term aesthesis is typical of many words and expressions that pick out perceptual awareness in many languages. So there are lots of words and expressions that have sort of a core root meaning that refers to sense perception, but that we extend to talk about other kinds of cognitive awareness that aren't perceptual. So 
especially when it comes to visual perception, this occurs. And we might say in some cases it's a metaphor, but in other cases it doesn't even seem to be metaphorical. It's just this is a way we use this expression. For example, we often say, I see the point. Is that a metaphor or not? I don't think it is. I think that that's just a way that we can describe having awareness of something. And the point that I'm trying to make, that I want you to see, is that this could be thought of as a case of perception. Right? We're using the word see. So there is a kind of looseness in many of our terms for cognitive states. And sometimes there is a kind of tendency to use words that have to do with sense perception. And there's a reason for that. It's also true to a lesser extent of some other expressions we use for perception that we also apply in extended senses to other types of cognitive awareness. We can say, I feel that this is wrong. I feel like I've made a mistake. Is that a metaphor or not? Well, you kind of do have a feeling when you make a mistake. Sometimes there's a bad feeling in your stomach or your chest. But there is here, if we're not careful, we might think that believing that you're wrong is a feeling, right? So we need to be careful of this kind of stuff. Something is fishy, right? That's obviously a reference to a smell or a taste. Something smells fishy, we might say, when we're talking about an answer to a question that's been given. Something's fishy about that example. Right? So there's all kinds of this. That's the point of giving these examples. So there is a wider application of isthesis where it can pick out not just things that we're aware of through our senses, but just things that we're aware of. Right? And this wider application of this term isthesis, I think, does serve to make Theotetus's initial claim that knowledge is isthesis more plausible than it would otherwise have been. Because it allows us, while we're focusing on cases of sense perception, to also have in our minds other types of awareness that clearly don't come to us through our senses, that we want to count as knowledge, but that can, if we're not thinking about it too carefully, be thought of as instances of perception. And if we're not too careful, we're not going to say, well, wait, is sense perception perception or is perception this wider thing? Right? We can move back and forth without recognizing it, and that's when we can start making mistakes. So this happens a bit in the dialogue, and in some of the texts we're going to be looking at in this lecture as we move on, we're going to see a push to expand the scope of perception, to include more things in it. And there are going to be some questions that are asked by Socrates that are going to, I think, push on this expanding and narrowing sense of perception. The point is that if someone's going to say knowledge is perception, they have to choose whether by perception they just mean what you do with your senses or they mean something wider. And there are going to be issues both ways. And if we don't get clear about what we mean exactly, it can be the case that we don't notice these issues and we think our definition is fine. So the first examples we get of isthesis in this dialogue all look like instances where we are made aware of qualities that are obviously perceptible through the senses, through the five senses. Size, temperature, color. You have two of these through your vision. Size and color. Temperature you have through your ability to sense things by touch. The scope of the term isthesis starts being expanded, first of all, somewhat subtly, and perhaps not even really, at 157d. I say it's a possible expansion. We get there a reference to qualities like good and beautiful. Socrates says, tell me again, then, whether you like the suggestion that good and beautiful and all the things we were just speaking of cannot be said to be anything, but are always coming to be. This looks like we're now talking under the scope of the thesis, that knowledge is perception, not just of things like size, temperature, and color, but also things that we're saying are good or beautiful and so on. Right? Those things do seem to go beyond what we take in with our eyes. 
maybe you can see something and maybe you think that part of what you see is that it's beautiful. That doesn't quite seem right to me. There's something else going on. And certainly for goodness, you don't smell goodness. I mean, it's, it's confusing, right? Because you can smell something and say, that smells good. Now, part of what's going on here is already happening when we're talking about perception. Because if you think about it, perception was given when we talked about the wind example as perception of something as something. So Socrates perceives that the wind is cold. Theotetus perceives that the wind is not cold. If you think about what we're saying is being perceived there, there's already a conceptualization, right? I'm perceiving, first of all, that the wind is cold. I'm perceiving the content of my perception is supposed to include a reference to some subject, the wind, something that we would say is a thing, and coldness, which we would say is a quality. But that seems to already include more than just perception. If you think about some animal that only has perception, does that animal perceive that the wind is cold? Well, if they don't have the concept of wind, probably not. They probably just perceive cold, or maybe not even that, something that makes them react in a certain way, right? So it's difficult to put our finger on, but already when we're talking about perception in the first bit, and we're talking about it in terms of perceiving that this is such and such, there's a lot of content being imported into perception that isn't necessarily there if we just think about an organism that only has perception, doesn't have conceptual awareness. These discussions are interesting because we can say of certain organisms, the clam perceives that the water is cold. And that can be an accurate representation. But of course, the, the clam doesn't perceive that the water is cold because it doesn't have the concept of water, right? There's some way that we're describing it that is accurate in our terms. But it's difficult to know what to say about what is being perceived, right? So anyway, already from the beginning, there is this thing going on where we say knowledge is perception, then we talk about what's perceived, and we've got a bunch of concepts going on. And this will become clear uh, and will become problematized later on. So in this case, we get in 157D, an expansion of the kind of concepts that might be included under perceptual awareness, the kinds of concepts that we might be able to attribute to things on the basis of having perceptions. And we get good and beautiful. Now, I say this is a possible expansion because this isn't introduced explicitly as an instance of aesthesis. We're not said to have an aesthesis or a perception of the fact that something is good or beautiful. But Instead, it's described as an instance of the thesis that everything is coming to be and nothing actually has being. This was this idea that when we attribute qualities to things, that is only true for a particular perceiver in a particular context and doesn't need to be true for somebody else. And even for the same perceiver, might not be true five minutes later. So this isn't explicitly said to be cases where we're perceiving something, but it's brought into the discussion as though it is. And so I think this is an expansion of the scope of what we're talking about, whether explicit or not. We then get later, not even that later, within the same page, a discussion of dreams and insanity. And then we get references to beliefs that one is God or one can fly. And these are definitely put forward as instances of isthesis. So if we mean awareness by isthesis, these obviously count. But I don't think that you get through your sense perception the thought that you are God, right? Because how do you perceive God? God is a concept that it seems like impossible to perceive. We have perceptual images of what God might be like. But whether we believe in God or not, we do tend to think that, you know, the old man with the beard idea, or even just light, or whatever, some force, those are not the essence of, of what we think of when we think about the divine, whether we believe or not. God's supposed to be something that we only really grasp with our minds. So the idea that you can have a perceptual belief that you are God 
doesn't really make sense. But as I suggested earlier, even the idea that the wind is cold has a lot of content to it. So we might really wonder whether that is actually something that we're getting through perception. Aren't there concepts there that we're getting from our minds and applying to our perception? This is a really tricky question to ask because when we perceive things and we have concepts, it's often the case that it just seems like we perceive them as that thing. Like when I see a dog in front of me, I say I see a dog and I really don't feel like what's happening is I see some, you know, brown in front of me, a brown splotch, and then I apply a concept to it. It really feels like I just see a dog and the concept is already there in what I see. Obviously, though, we can't take that kind of statement at face value. So we get this extension of perception, good and beautiful. This extension in the text is already foreshadowed by an earlier list of perceptions, cases of isthesis, found at 156b. There, cases of aesthetic awareness of perceptual awareness, are said to include sight, hearing, smelling, feeling cold, and feeling hot. Also what are called pleasures and pains. These all feel like cases that we take in through our senses. Desires? Hmm. Fears? There's definitely a component where, like, I'm aware of my body, and that tells me I'm desiring or fearing. But there's a lot more content, right? What if I desire to go to Disneyland? Is that something I just feel? Like, I wake up with a headache and I say I have a headache, and then the same way, I just wake up and from considering my body alone, I can say, oh, I, that's the feeling of wanting to go to Disneyland. No, you need all kinds of concepts, right? So by adding desires and fears, we're expanding what is included under isthesis in a pretty significant way, okay? And good and beautiful, which I've already been mentioned, these are clearly evaluative predicates. They're predicates that involve an evaluation of something. And this is why, of course, we disagree with them. Uh, we disagree with one another when people say this. That's beautiful. No, it's not. This is good. No, I don't think that's good at all. So that's where I want sort of the recap at a much deeper level, hopefully, to end. I'm going to move into the challenges for the thesis. I only have one slide that doesn't really fit in the narrative that I was just discussing or in the challenge to the thesis. This concerns the mystery doctrine, and I just wanted to say this because I didn't get to it last time. During the last lecture, we discussed the so-called mystery doctrine associated by Socrates with Heraclitus and others. Okay, this is the idea that everything is in motion all the time. Now, this was called the mystery doctrine, and I kind of passed over this fact. I think it's significant that it's referred to as a mystery doctrine because it might be intended to indicate something more than it's normally taken to indicate. So it's normally taken to indicate, and this is certainly correct, that it's a mystery doctrine because maybe Protagoras doesn't explicitly commit to this. Right? So one of the things we're doing when we're saying it's a mystery doctrine is a kind of like wink-wink. This isn't really what the person said, and we're kind of importing it and saying this is what this person said because we think it fits, but it's a mystery doctrine because we're sort of conceding that the person never actually said this. Right? But I think there's more going on here. Because I think if you look at this whole doctrine that gets expanded involving slow motions that interact and fast motions being created, this goes beyond pretty substantially what it looks like we can have evidence for on the thesis that knowledge is perception. Because if you think that knowledge is just perception, are we perceiving these motions, we don't ever perceive the motions. This is a claim about what looks like the deep metaphysical structure of reality. And we don't perceive the motions. We perceive the sensible qualities that the slow motions give rise to. And we could say perhaps we perceive the fast motions in a way. But the slow motions are said to be there. They represent how things are in themselves, but we don't see them. And remember, we don't even know ourselves. We're not even totally aware of ourselves until we are aware of the fact that we are perceivers. So it's said that we are tied in our being to 
the twins. So I know myself by perceiving something cold, and I also have a perception of a cold thing. The two fast motions go together. But all of this idea of the slow motions, that's not something we get from perception, right? So I think part of the so-called mystery doctrine is also supposed to indicate that this actually should be a mystery to us if we think that knowledge is perception. So this is important to see because a lot of what's going on in this first section, and this goes for much of this dialogue, is that we're trying to work out what it means to say knowledge is perception, but it kind of looks like we keep helping ourselves to a bunch of things that we shouldn't be able to help ourselves to if it's really true that knowledge is perception. If it's really true that knowledge is perception, is it also true that we perceive that, you know, the statue is beautiful? Do we perceive beauty or do we need a concept? Maybe we do perceive beauty, but first we need the concept. And that's more than just something we perceive. Okay. Likewise, if it's really just true that knowledge is perception and all instances of knowledge are instances that we just perceive through our five senses, well, we don't perceive any of this stuff about the motions, right? This is a huge theory that's meant to account for what we do perceive and meant to account for certain alleged differences between the perceptions had by individuals. But this is not something that we perceive. And so if knowledge is exhausted by things we take in through the five senses, well, this is not going to count as an instance of knowledge. And so it makes sense to call it a mystery, right? How can we possibly know about the four emotions? How can we possibly know the additional claim that every perception that anyone has is totally unique and won't be replicated ever again, right? There's a claim that the way I'm seeing this now is going to be different in five minutes. How do I know? Well, on this theory, I don't. I can compare them, but is that something that involves more than perception? Now we're bringing memory in, right, if we're comparing. So what happens in this section, and we see this in the criticisms that we're getting under the challenging the thesis part that I'm going to talk about right now, we see that there's already a real tension in this view. Because on the one hand, we want to say, oh, yes, perception, that's that thing that we have when there's cold wind and we start shivering and feel very unpleasant. Or that's what we have when we look at something and it looks a certain way. It looks green, right? But even when I'm saying it looks green, again, is that perception or is that perception with some concepts? And this is going to ultimately be why this definition doesn't work, because there's a recognition that concepts and judgment are involved when you have a content that you can be right or wrong about. That comes later when this definition is rejected. But already there's this tension going the whole way through. And I think this mystery doctrine is part of Plato trying to show us that this tension is there. Right? We have this theory that knowledge is perception. Here's something that it looks like we're saying we might know all this stuff about these motions, but we don't perceive that. So just by making this claim, it looks like we are refuting the claim that knowledge is just perception because we're claiming to have knowledge of something we don't perceive. So challenging the thesis. So the thesis is given. There are some challenges raised immediately. So Socrates starts out challenging the thesis by bringing up cases of dreams, hallucinations, insanity, disease. So Socrates next asks about things that we perceive in dreams, things that people who are insane or diseased perceive. These are the kinds of things that we can agree are hallucinations. And these seem like they are pretty strong challenges, if not refutations, of the theory that knowledge is perception when understood in terms of the first claim that Bernier drew out, that all instances of perception are instances of knowledge, right? Hallucinations are, by definition, not veridical. They are supposed to be ideas of things that are there that aren't there, right? A madman thinks he's God. That's not really a perception at all because, in a way, because it isn't representational. And right? there's nothing, it is, this is tricky, but it doesn't represent reality. A dreamer imagines he has wings, well, he doesn't. A dreamer imagines that he or she is flying, well, they're not. Right? So hallucinations look like a real challenge to the first thing that Bernier tells us comes out of knowledge's perception, which is that all instances of perception are instances of knowledge. 
And Socrates goes on to point out that actually when we're having dreams, we can't even tell that we're dreaming. Right? There are times when we might ask ourselves, are, am I dreaming? And the answer is no, but in fact, we're wrong. So I think this is brought up to kind of indicate to us that when it comes to just what's being experienced, oftentimes dreams are qualitatively indistinguishable from perceptions we might have when we're awake. Now, the thing about hallucinations and dreams is that we concede, when we call something a hallucination or a dream, that it's actually not caused by some external object that it is supposed to represent. Because that's a big part of what we think of when we think of perception. It's like, yes, when I see something, part of the explanation is that I have in my experience some awareness, and that is present when we're talking about dreams or hallucinations. I have an awareness of a monster if I'm hallucinating a monster or if I'm looking at a monster. But there's a difference, right? Because when I'm perceiving it, my experience is caused by something in the world that we think my experience is in some way supposed to represent, right? So if I'm perceiving a monster, that's more than just the claim that I'm having an experience of a monster. It's that I'm having an experience of a monster that's caused by something in the external world that my perception is in some way or another presented as a representation of. Now, I put things in this way because you might think that hallucinations and dreams are caused by external objects too, right? Like if I take LSD and I have hallucinations, you can say that my hallucinations are caused by an external object, the drug that I took. However, what's not going on here is when I have a hallucination, say I hallucinate a monster when I'm on drugs, it's not like the monster is supposed to represent the object that is causing it, right? And that's the difference. In perception, there's an assumption that what it is that we're experiencing is causally related to what it is that's causing it, and that also happens with drugs. But there's an extra thing. It's kind of being seen as a representation of the cause, whereas the monster I see isn't viewed as a representation of the drug that I took. It might be caused by it, but it's not viewed as a representation of that. And that's really different. So when we're bringing in dreams and insanity, we've got a, a real challenge to the thesis because now it's like these things might have causes, but they aren't cases where we have an attempt to represent an object. Or it's not even an attempt. Like when we have a perception, it's like we view it as that. We're not trying to. But if I perceive that the wind is cold, I believe that what I'm having goes with what's happening in the world. Now, there can be times when, when I shiver and I don't actually even view that as a perceptual awareness, right? Because I might think that I'm just having a kind of, you know, internal state because I'm sick or something. And, and I don't ever think, well, it must be cold out. Maybe it's the middle of summer. That would be something similar to a hallucination and dream here. These hallucinations and dreams, it's not quite right when I say they aren't caused by any kind of external objects. They can be. You could have a bad dream because you ate like a, a bologna sandwich or something. But they're not caused by external objects that they are presented as representations of. That's the big difference. So we have these cases of dreams and hallucinations. Now, we might think that when Theotetus hears about these cases, his best bet would be just to deny that these are perceptions. I mean, you could say, well, no, these aren't really perceptions because perceptions are representations of the things that cause them, and, and these aren't like that. He doesn't do that, though. And I mean, I suppose he doesn't do it in part because now we have to have a bunch of other information in our theory to rule these out as cases of perception, and that would have to include us helping ourselves to all kinds of information that we don't get through perception. So now it's like we're loading into our theory more stuff that our theory doesn't entitle us to claim as knowledge. And so that might be a bad decision. At any rate, Theotetus doesn't go this way. Instead, he just bites the bullet and tries to accommodate dreams and hallucinations within the theory. And he tries to treat them as instances of perception and also as instances of veridical perception. So they are treated not just as cases of perception, but cases of perception that 
are entitled to be called true. Now, there is a sleight of hand that goes on here, and it's important to see it. There's a bit of a trick that happens here that allows these perceptions to be treated as true. Perceptions are put under the category of accurate because they are the result of interactions between slow motions that cause fast motions. And it is pointed out that individuals who are sick or insane or dreaming, they're in a different state than individuals that are healthy or sane or awake. And it is said, well, if two people are in a different state, are they the same? No. Well, since they're not the same, and since we have this causal theory of how perceptual awareness gets born in terms of these motions, we can just say, well, look, there's a sense in which if I'm hallucinating, my perception is of something real. That sense has to do with the idea that my awareness when I'm hallucinating is the result of a real interaction between real things. On this theory, if I'm hallucinating or dreaming, or if I'm seeing something in reality, in either case, there's going to be some explanation of what's happening that's going to depend only on things that are true. Right? It's true that I took this drug, and it's true that that's causing these motions that correspond to an experience of, of something that's not there. So perception gets to be classed as, sorry, hallucination gets to be classed as cases of true awareness in a sort of roundabout way that really changes the point. Because when we're saying that a perception is veridical or true, what that means is that it represents reality in a way that has some hope of being accurate. Now, when we talk about things like color or temperature, it does seem like we could say that all of those are correct. Because if I feel cold, well, then I feel cold. Like, if I'm just talking about the experience I have, that looks like something that uh, maybe I can't be wrong about. But once we start bringing in con all these concepts and things like that, it can be that the way that I'm seeing things we might think, can misrepresent what's there. And what I'm saying here is when we talk about hallucinations and dreams and things like that, that seems like a really difficult case because there, there isn't even, I mean, there is in the dream some assumption that the representation is a representation of the thing that's causing it. So if I hallucinate a monster while on drugs, there is an assumption in me, and this is why the hallucination is so terrifying, that there's a monster there and that my perception in some way represents something that's there in front of me. And of course, on this theory, we're going to say, well, there's a bunch of motions in front of me that interact with me. When we're talking about a dream, though, if the dream was caused by like a sandwich that I ate, that my monster that I'm seeing isn't a representation of the sandwich. It's supposed to be something in front of me and the sandwich is in my stomach, right? So there's all of these differences. And there is this sleight of hand that goes on here where we give a certain kind of legitimacy to all cases of hallucination and dream simply by noticing that they are caused by things that are real. My hallucination is real in this sense because it's caused by a drug. But is that really what we mean when I say my perception is veridical, true, accurate? No. When I say that, I'm saying that what my perception purports to represent is something in reality. And that's not what we're saying if I'm saying, yeah, my perception is totally real because it's the result of taking a drug that was real. Right? So it's one thing to talk about the causal processes that gave rise to something. It's another thing to talk about whether the content of the thing that is given rise to is an accurate representation. This is a bit of a quick move that I think we're supposed to catch. So it is said, when the active factor finds Socrates ill then, to begin with, it is not in truth the same man it gets hold of, because as we saw, it has come upon an unlike. So this is a case where illness is at issue, and this is easier to deal with, because you can say, well, when you perceive 
the orange juice and you're really sick, maybe it has no taste and you taste it as neutral instead of a bit sour. And maybe you could say that is reality because that's the reaction that you're having based on your case. And when you perceive it as neutral, how do you choose who's having the right one and who isn't? How can you, how can you say that my perception when I'm sick is worse than your perception when you're not without bringing in some extra stuff? Because in both cases, what's being perceived is a reflection of actual reality. It's a reflection of what's out there, the orange juice, and a reflection of something about me that I'm sick and my sinuses are blocked or whatever. When you get to hallucinations, though, I think it is easier to say that one person is not experiencing things correctly and one person is. Because if you're hallucinating a monster and you then try to attack that monster, you're going to have trouble doing that. Or if you're hallucinating orange juice and you try to drink it, it might be that the hallucination continues and you drink it. Or it might be that, you know, you come to awareness and, you know, now you're eating garbage. And that was a bad trip, you know. So it's, uh, it's tricky when we're talking about hallucinations. And it seems like there's an easier time of saying, no, that wasn't accurate than there would be in cases of illness. But what we're doing here is trying to conflate, is there an explanation of what's happening that discusses realities with is what's being experienced veridical? Those are two separate questions. So to recap what I just said, we are kind of getting rid of, in some way, the content of perception when we're talking about these things as true perceptions. The discussion of dreams and hallucinations has vindicated, in scare quotes I say, the status of perception only by explaining it in a way that doesn't vindicate its content. So when we're talking about hallucination and saying, well, yeah, hallucination is, is totally real. It's a real constituent of the universe. Therefore, it's veridical because it's caused by something. And we can give an explanation. That is precisely to ignore what its content is. Hallucinations and dreams have a physical explanation. And in terms of the theory, the mystery theory that we're developing, that means that they can be explained by interactions between passive motions. But this doesn't tell us anything about whether these kinds of perceptions, these hallucinations, etc., represents anything accurately. In the case of dreams and hallucinations, even the theory of motion seems to be, I say, of questionable relevance. And that's only because it seems like in the way the theory is put that the fast motions that are produced by the slow motions, it does kind of seem like they're being presented as representations of the slow motions. Where if I'm hallucinating because I took a drug, the slow motion might be the drug, and then the fast motion is going to be what I perceive, but that's not ever viewed as a representation of the drug. So the causal story and the representational story come apart in a certain way. So it's true that all perceptual states have causal explanations, and everyone's going to have to agree with this, right? Everyone, any theory of perception is going to involve material things affecting each other, your eye getting hit by light or, you know, receptors in your brain firing in certain ways or whatever. There's going to be a causal explanation. And it is true when we're viewing perception through this mechanistic causal story, it's true that Describing perceptual states as wrong or erroneous when we're in that method of looking at the world, when we're looking at things in that mode, it's true that those words don't really have an application. Because when we're just viewing something in this mechanistic way like that, it all has causal explanations. And whether you're hallucinating or not, there's going to be some explanation of what's going on, even if we don't know what it is right now. But... It doesn't really make sense when we're just talking about that level to bring in questions of veridical perception, erroneous perception, wrong perception, right perception. The point is, though, and I think this is what's being missed here when Theotetus brings this up, that we don't take perceptual states, when we view them as perceptual states, as just a current states, like I say transient nausea, so you feel sick for half of a second, or discomfort, and you feel uncomfortable for half a second. Because these kinds of states, if you just feel sick for half a second, a lot of times you don't view that 
as anything more than an occurrence state. You shudder. You don't necessarily think in your mind that you're shuddering as a result of something in reality. It might just be that you're viewing it as something that's happening to you, and maybe you haven't assigned a cause to it in the sense that you're saying it's representing something that's real in the world. Maybe it's just something that's happening to you as a result of some strange electrical impulse in your brain or something. Okay, But when we look at perceptual states, we don't just view them as occurrent states that are caused by causes that they don't represent. Instead, we view them as representational, and we tend to think of them as accurate or accurate. And it's really that fact that we view perception in that way that makes the idea that knowledge is perception plausible in the first place. Because if we don't think of perceptions as anything other than occurrence states, then we don't think of them as representational. And the idea that they have any content and might be called knowledge doesn't really make any sense. If a traffic light turns green, that's a result of some causes. I would never say that that's knowledge, right? That's just something that happens, or a stone falls. That would never be my definition of knowledge. It needs to have some representational content. And I'm noting here in this discussion of the hallucination stuff that we're kind of ignoring that. And that's a mistake. Another thing to bring up here when we're talking about these cases, uh, which comes in, is there are some interesting claims made about self-awareness. And basically, it's sort of suggested that there is no self in a certain way, or not in the way that we think there is. In this discussion, it's kind of off topic, but it's really, really interesting. So we are told in this section that we're looking at that our awareness of both our perceptions and of ourselves as perceivers are inextricably tied to one another on the theory that's developed. So we're aware of ourselves, and I've said this before, only in acts of perception that are tied to specific objects. So Socrates says, I must, necess I must necessarily become percipient of something when I become percipient. And it's said that we're tied to these kinds of partners, they're called. So I'm aware of myself perceiving, or I'm aware of perception going on, to put it more accurately. And I'm aware of an object. These are said to be partners that are tied to each other by necessity. You can't have one without the other. It is also said that those things are tied to each other, but on the contrary, it is denied that we are so tied to prior states of our respective selves. At least initially that's denied. Right? So what I'm saying here is the theory that's happening is really just like a bunch of buzzing, blinking confusion. You have a number of perceptual awareness states happening in succession, and those are all tied to objects. There's an awareness and an object. And it isn't the case that those are unified by this theory into oneself. It's just a bunch of stuff that happens. And you're even said to be a different person slightly later in a certain way. So the current theory seems to involve a succession of momentary acts of awareness without any self. And this is something that isn't taken up explicitly and theorized about much, but it is there. One of the things that has always interested me in the way that this theory is developed in terms of the motions is that we do have this kind of assumption that the motions come in pairs. And I mentioned in an earlier lecture that it's strange to me, why do we think that there's going to be two fast motions? Why not just think that there's just one, the experience? It does seem like even in the way this is developed, it's kind of like we are respecting in our development of the theory, the idea that the self is distinct from the objects it cognizes. Because we're putting into the theory this idea of two fast motions that correspond, when really, if you think about what's happening when you're perceiving, it's just like some awareness is there. Right? And it looks like even just built into this theory that's developed, there's a respect for the difference between a self and things that aren't. But at the same time, in text, uh, in the section that we're looking at, there is a kind of denial. So that's the first discussion. First objection, we could call it, comes from dreams and hallucination. A further objection comes from the idea that there doesn't seem to be any possibility of wisdom in the Theotetus theory that's being developed. So the first 
really strong objection that is put as an objection. We get this stuff about hallucinations, but it isn't formally in the part where we talk about objections, because there's something that happens where the theory seems to be developed, and now we say, okay, let's run it around the hearth. There's a reference to the custom of taking an infant and running around a table with it, um, and now it is uh, officially our child. We're deciding we're going to keep this one. It's some kind of Greek custom. Reminds me, if those of you know Full House, there was an old Full House episode where DJ walks around a table with a boy, and now she's married to him. Right? It's one of these kinds of rituals. Um, and that is also supposed to be a Greek ritual. Jesse Katsopoulos, Uncle Jesse, he knows about it. He's well aware. So we have this part where we say, okay, now we're going to test the theory. See if, it, if it's a child or some kind of wind egg, which is really like a fart, to be honest. And it's like, maybe there is no baby. It's like a food baby, as people say. I find all that disgusting, so I'm not going to talk about it anymore. But this is, this is what's being done here. We're testing it more explicitly. So the first sort of explicit objection that comes in this section is that there can be no wisdom. And here, wisdom refers in particular to a kind of expert knowledge, right? When we talk about wisdom, Yoda, I always bring up Yoda because he's the only wise person that I think uncontroversial we can all agree on these days. Yoda is wise, and it's supposed to be the case that Yoda is wise because not everyone has that. That's why you have to go to Tatooine or whatever the planet is. Dagobah? I don't know. It's been a while since I watched that movie. I don't... I'm an adult. <laughs> so, anyway. Um, wisdom is, by definition, supposed to be expertise. It's supposed to be expert knowledge. It's a word that entails that you have a state that by definition not everyone has. And what the objection here is supposed to be is that if Theotetus is right, nobody knows more than anybody else. Right? And this is first used as a kind of ad hominem argument against Protagoras, because Protagoras is someone who travels around and gets people to pay money because he purports to have a kind of awareness that not everyone has, and he can bring this to you. And so he's giving you a great product because you don't have this and he's got it. Not many people have it. So you have to go to him. Right? So the idea that Protagoras's views when developed lead to the denial of wisdom looks bad for Protagoras. That's why I say it's an ad hominem argument. Now, this is first brought up in a statement that if Protagoras is right and man is the measure of all things, really, when we look at the theory, Socrates suggests, he could just as well have said pig is the measure of all things. Gods, human beings, animals, men will all be equally, on this theory, entitled to say that their perceptions are true. Because even if, like, a cockroach perceives something, well, there's some causal story to tell about why that perception is a result of real factors interacting. And so why not say cockroach is the measure of all things? Right? And that's supposed to look bad, especially the reference to God is supposed to look bad because... Remember, we're still in ancient Greece, and this is still a context in which you can get in trouble for disrespecting the Greek gods. Right? So to say that somebody's got a theory that suggests that really the gods are no wiser than an insect, that would be a dangerous charge. Socrates says, I was astonished that he, Protagoras, did not say at the beginning of the truth, that's the book of Protagoras, that pig is the measure of all things, or baboon. Right? So we're getting here a kind of reductio ad absurdum of the theory. We're, we're taking the theory, developing it, and then seeing that it has an absurd conclusion. We're supposed to just deny. We're supposed to have a strong revulsion towards the suggestion that baboon is the measure of all things. Because baboons aren't supposed to be wise. But on this theory, we're just as wise as any other animal. So this gets developed as an ad hominem against Protagoras ad hominem being a kind of argument that doesn't attack the theory so much as it attacks the individual who presents it, right? And generally in philosophy, we don't love ad hominem arguments because in many ways they're unfair and they change the point. Because the idea is if someone's got a theory and we want to assess that, we're going to give arguments against it. But really, it doesn't matter who came up with the theory, right? So this happens a lot where people discredit what someone has said and they don't talk about the content of what was said. They just say, well, this person, obviously, I mean, you're going to listen to this person. This person is a horrible human being. 
So what, nothing they ever say has any semblance of truth to it? Of course not. And that's why ad hominems are bad. You know, someone could be an awful human being, um, a terrible criminal that's murdered all kinds of people. It doesn't mean that they have false beliefs about the weather. Right? So to, to go ad hominem is, generally speaking, a bad thing. It can, though, sometimes have some relevance. Because sometimes if someone lives their life in a way that really doesn't correspond to what the thing that they are saying is true represents, that puts pressure on them, okay? We're going to see a very famous self-refutation argument later on, that the theory that Protagoras holds actually contradicts itself. That's a kind of ad hominem, but really it isn't, okay? But here we get an ad hominem. If whatever the individual judges by means of perception is true for him, if no man can assess another's experience better than he, or can claim authority to examine another man's judgment and see if he be right or wrong, if, as we have repeatedly said, only the individual can judge of his own world, and what he judges is true or correct, how could it ever be, my friend, that Protagoras was a wise man, so wise as to think himself fit to be the teacher or of other men and worth large fees? So here, this is really something that if you're not Protagoras, you don't need to have a problem with. So this is an issue for Protagoras as a person, it's not necessarily an issue for the theory. Now, it can be an issue for the theory, and I think it is, if we recognize that, in fact, everyone who holds this theory makes assumptions that don't correspond with the theory in the same way Protagoras does. And this is developed next when this is expanded a little bit further, and it is suggested that really the theory that's being developed makes instruction and correction and learning and things like that impossible. And it does, because if it's really the case that all perceptions are equally correct, because all of them have some causal explanation, how can you possibly learn? And this is especially true when we recognize that perceptual access is said here to be private and privileged, meaning when I have a perception, a perceptual experience, I'm the only one who has that in the moment. So if nobody has access to my perceptual content, nobody can have evidence to refute the so-called knowledge that I'm having. No one can say your experience doesn't add up because they can't get access to what I'm perceiving. It's mine alone. And in fact, perceptions are said to be private even to the moment in which they occur, things that cannot be experienced again. Right? So even I can't necessarily correct myself because maybe later I think the water is warm when I thought it was cold before, but that's just a different experience had by different motions in different cases. So each perception is a unique result of interactions between different kinds of motions. The motions are different. The perception is different. You can't say I was wrong earlier. No, things have changed. So this theory, as will soon become clear, also rules out the possibility that one might learn from experience. You can't correct your earlier perceptions. They were what they were, and your perceptions now are what they are. They're just different. Socrates goes on to talk about the fact that this theory seems to make philosophical discussion impossible or pointless as part of an extension of this view that you can't really improve or correct or refute another person's perceptual judgments on this theory if they're all equally correct. Notice, though, that the reference to philosophy here confirms that the theory scope has drastically expanded from the original description. Because if we're talking about philosophy, if we think about what people philosophize about, they don't debate about whether the wind is hot or cold in a philosophy class, right? They're debating about concepts that are a little bit more abstract than that, hopefully. And so if the theory is meant to have repercussions for those kinds of philosophical discussions, then it's clearly going to have to include more in terms of what content we're aware of through perception. So again, we see this expansion of what's being included in perception here. And I, I think this is all very conscious on Plato's part. I think he's playing with this expanding and contracting idea of, of perception. And this is part of the issue. And I, like I said, I think this is there right from the beginning when we are said to perceive that the wind is cold, because already there are concepts involved. Now, the next objection that we get in this objection section, and this would be the last part that I talk about, 
involves cases where it looks like we have perception, but we lack something that we sometimes have that we would call knowledge. Well now, are we going to agree that when we perceive things by seeing or hearing them, we always at the same time know them? Take, for example, the case of hearing people speak a foreign language, which we have not yet learned. Are we going to say that we do not hear their voices when they speak? Or that we both hear them and know what they are saying? Again, suppose we do not know our letters. Are we going to insist that we do not see them when we look at them? Or shall we maintain that if we see them, we know them? So here, we're getting references to precisely what I was talking about when I mentioned that when we say we know that the wind is cold, it looks like there's some conceptual awareness going on there. This is really brought out explicitly here when we talk about a case where you hear someone speaking a language, and it's definitely the case that you perceive it, you're hearing the sounds, but you're not hearing what I'm hearing in a certain way, because with my knowledge of the language they're speaking, I'm hearing words. And really, if you study a bit of linguistics, it is also true that even before we know what is being said, when we're aware of another language, we start segmenting what is being said. I think even at a perceptual level, the way we're hearing it starts changing, right? And we class things as the same sounds or different sounds, even before we start speaking when we're infants. Like if we've been exposed to people speaking a language enough, the infant will actually start hearing, ah, oh, that sound is the same as that other sound. Right? If the language is uh, Korean, say, the infant will put the right sounds together, whereas me as a non, I've never been exposed or haven't been exposed much, I'm just going to hear uh, something that sounds like uh, a mumble of things, right? And, you know, this is true of any language. When you don't know a language, it often sounds random to you. And, you know, this is an interesting phenomenon. Like, it's very difficult, I think almost impossible, to do an impersonation of your own language without using words. Like, if, if I have to say what an English speaker sounds like, I can do it with different accents, of course, but just English in general, not really. Um, whereas if I don't know anything about the language, and in fact, it seems like the less I know, the better, it's easier to do some kind of impersonation where you just make a bunch of sounds and people go, oh, that sounds like a Swedish person, right? So there's this thing that's going on, at any rate, which has to do with the fact that when we're saying we're hearing people speaking a language, that's actually quite a complicated statement. And it might mean different things. It might just mean we hear sounds. It might mean we hear sounds that we recognize as coming in units that we segment, that we break up into words. Because if you actually look acoustically at what people say, in many cases, there aren't actual breaks between the words per se. And we segment them themselves and we hear them as discrete units, perhaps. So there's an interim stage where maybe there's some segmentation going on in the sounds that are heard. You don't just hear blah, 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 some kind of string, right? You hear sounds that come in units, even if you don't know what the words are. And then, of course, there's another stage where you have actually words that you're hearing. And you recognize that these things are sound strings that are supposed to correspond to meanings. So there's a lot going on here. And this objection pushes on the fact that even when we're just talking about hearing, there's a complexity to that that we need to address in order to understand and evaluate the claim that knowledge is perception. Now, the way that I view what's going on here is as objections that force us to confront an implicit dilemma. We have two options, two ways that we can address this, and neither of them seem very good for our theory. So I say the horn we can take. This is often how we discuss dilemmas in philosophy. We say this is a dilemma. You have two horns, meaning two ways that you can address what's been said. And both of them are horns because it's like a bull. You don't want to get caught on either horn. Two bad options. What horn we take depends on whether we class the further instances that are said to be knowledge here as perceptions or not, right? So the claim is you sometimes hear a language and it's non-controversial that you're hearing something, but then one person who understands the language 
will hear something different than the person who just hears the sounds will hear. You can either, when that's been brought up, you can either say, well, the further things that are understood when the person who understands the language is hearing, those are also instances of perception. You can do that, or you can deny that those are instances of perception. So, no, all that's being perceived are the basic sounds. The other stuff isn't perception. Now, we have a problem, though, because either of these lead to consequences that aren't great for the theory. So let's start out and think that we deny that what we know when we hear a language that we already understand is a further instance of perception. So let's say, look, perception just means the sounds. And so really, the two people are perceiving sounds. And the stuff that you're talking about understanding the language, that's not perception. Now, if you do that, it looks like we're violating the second proposition in the two propositions that Bernier uh, gives us to make more explicit the idea that Theotetus has. All instances of knowledge are instances of perception. Right? Well, if we're saying that there's something to knowing a language which transcends, goes beyond what's happening when you're just hearing sounds, then it looks like proposition two here is being violated. Because now we're saying, well, that's not perception, but it's still something we call knowledge. Now, we could go further and deny and say, well, no one has knowledge of languages. That seems very implausible. It can be that we have a theory that allows us, as I said earlier, to throw out some of our example cases, but to come up with a theory of knowledge where no one can know a language, where that means understanding meanings and things, that sounds really, really bad. So it looks like if we deny that these further things that are understood when we hear the sounds are instances of perception, we are denying proposition two. There will be instances of knowledge that are not instances of perception. Namely, the content one grasps when grasping meaning. Because right? so if we're denying that those are perceptions, well, that's something that looks like knowledge, but it's denied that it's perception. The other thing that we can do, which is actually closer to what happens in the dialogue, is take the other horn of the dilemma and say that actually when we understand meaning, that's also perceptual knowledge, perceptual awareness. Theotetus says, we shall say, Socrates, that we know just that in them which we see and hear. We both see and know the shape and the color of the letters, and with the spoken words, we both hear and know the rise and fall of the voice. But what schoolmasters and interpreters tell us about them, we don't perceive by seeing or hearing, and we don't know either. So you might think that this is actually meant to deny that these are cases of knowledge. But I think in context, what this is really saying is, if I don't know the language, I perceive certain things. As a non-speaker, I look at the word on the page and I just see some squiggles. Now, this is especially true if you're looking at characters that are different than the ones that you're used to, right? If you're used to Latin characters or Cyrillic characters, then you're going to have a hard time looking at uh, Chinese characters. I know there are different systems and stuff, so I don't really know what I'm talking about here. But you get the point. So... We have uh, what looks like it might be a denial that we have further knowledge. I think it's better to understand in context that we're saying here, look, there are some people who have some perceptions when they see characters on a page or they hear words. There are other people who have also other perceptions, and those would be the meanings. So we could take this as a statement that denies that when I don't understand a language, I have those further perceptions. I don't perceive it by seeing or hearing, but the implication is maybe other people do. So I, at any rate, am taking this passage as a possible move to suggest that what's happening when we understand meanings is further perception. So we can retain two, we can still have it come out as plausible that all knowledge is perception by saying, well, actually, when you know a language, the meanings that you understand are things that you perceive, okay? So it's like, look, I perceive just the sound. You perceive a sound and a meaning. My thing that I have is knowledge. Your thing that you have is knowledge. So we can say that some people have more perceptions than others when they hear a language. And, you know, this seems to work fairly well with the theory at first because given the theory of perception that's developed so far, a crucial element of that 
is that part of what generates perceptual experience is the motions that we say constitute the subject, the person, right? So if you know a language, well, you've got different motions. And so you don't just generate the offspring of like hearing the sounds. You also get this perceptual offspring that we would say is an awareness of meaning. Right? So, of course, we can account for this. If we say these are further perceptions, you can say, well, yeah, of course, some people, when they hear the sounds, just hear the sounds and don't get these further perceptions of meaning. Other people are different. And so they perceive meanings too. What's the problem, right? That's a, a way that we can go that looks more promising than the initial denial uh, that these things are instances of perception. Now, if we take this horn, we are significantly widening the scope of perception. And so now again, we get explicitly this tension about what perception includes and what it doesn't. So imagine we bite the bullet and say that these are cases of perception as well. Well, that might look okay, but now the question I have is, is the mystery doctrine still plausible? Remember, the mystery doctrine is that everybody has different motions. The different motions give different perceptions in each case, but also there was this further commitment, which is that nobody ever has exactly the same perceptual experience as anybody else. So when we're including within perception what written or spoken characters mean, it seems to me that this is less plausible, that everyone has a different content. So it seems somewhat plausible to me to say that everybody sees green a bit differently, and maybe even that even within what we call one person in ordinary language, that me now sees green differently than I did 10 seconds ago, because my motions are a bit different. So... That seems at least somewhat plausible. Is it plausible to claim, though, that everyone has their own private understanding when they say that dog refers to a dog? Or that dog is pronounced dog? That's my attempt to be phonetic. Um, so, we have here these further claims that these are perceptions, and we're really to think that no perceptions are ever the same as any others. Because remember, that was a key part of the idea that all perceptions are knowledge. Because they're just totally different, and you really can't say one's right and one is wrong because they just have different causal histories. Now, is it really plausible to say that I have a totally different understanding of a term than you do? We both hear the person say dog, and your grasp is totally different. Now, you could bite the bullet. You could say, well, everyone has a slightly different understanding of dog, and maybe that's even right, right? Maybe your understanding of dog includes your dog, and I've never met your dog, or I just don't care. Right? Maybe my conception of dog is like rin tin tin and like pit bulls and a deep sense of disgust because I, I find dogs really quite, I don't like them. Uh, maybe you love them, right? So you have a positively valent perception that comes up when you hear this word. So you could... You know, and especially if you're if you're deeply into, um, you know, French continental philosophy, you might make a career of saying that it's impossible for individuals ever to communicate with each other uh, simply because it's all totally different and no one ever has the same perception. And so it's all just a matter of, uh, you know, using power to subjugate people whenever you try to get them to agree that you're right. right. You could take this line and it's a line that people have made careers. It seems very implausible. Um, to me, not to mention, practically speaking, having really, really terrible consequences. But it's something that people can say. So maybe you bite this bullet. It doesn't seem as plausible to me as saying that we all see green slightly differently. Saying that we all have a different understanding of a term, if that's a perceptual awareness, seems less plausible. So I'm going to stop there. Um, I'm going to put a question up for discussion online. We will be going back into the classroom, it looks like, at the end of the month. So those of you who have asked, I'll put up an announcement about this. We will be, as we're supposed to, meeting in person, which will be great. Have a great weekend.